tried really hard not to be a professional footballer and failed badly. But it was, I'm kind of happy I had that failure because it led to a really interesting set of um, adventures through my life and it's, it's been brilliant and it's great to be able to put them in the book. Well, it's fabulous to see a live audience, isn't it? It is, and quite and lively live yes, audience. Yes, yes. We'll soon put an end to that. <laughs> we're also going out online all around the world, and we're streaming live to the Burke Cent Film Centre in Aberfeldy. So, <laughs> hello, Perthshire. <laughs> well, welcome to this afternoon's session. My name is Val McDermott, and I have the pleasure this afternoon of introducing someone who, judging by the eager looks on your faces, genuinely needs no introduction, but he's getting one anyway. You'll all be familiar with his voice and his face from radio and TV, where his stated aim is to tell us what we don't know. Then there's his very public advocacy for indie music and his regular stints behind the turntables as a club and festival DJ. And of course, his tireless and passionate work as a union official and advocate for his colleagues. A few of you may have encountered him in his other career as the accidental footballer. My fellow readers, please welcome Pat Nevin. Thank you. Your playing career was stellar. Clyde, Chelsea, Everton, Tranmere, Rovers, Kilmarnock, Motherwell. More goals and assists than I can count. 28 Scottish caps and a reputation as the trickiest winger around. Not something nobody's ever accused me of being. <laughs> so first off, let's talk about the title of your book. By your own admission, you spent every spare waking moment as a child with a ball at your feet, playing with your dad, your brothers, the other kids in your street, your schoolmates. Now, People who know about these things say it takes 10,000 hours to master anything. By my reckoning, you must have hit that target by the time you were 10. <laughs> yes. So why the accidental footballer? Yeah, it, it does seem slightly odd. First of all, I have to own up immediately. Not my title idea. I was, I, mine was the, the importance of not being earnest, because I was very earnest when I was very young. Um, but I think the accidental football had actually summed it up better because, in, in the simplest terms, I adored playing football. I loved actually playing football. You know, from a very, very young age, for a variety of reasons. I loved the fitness side of it. I loved the fact that you could show your skills, but also be pure creativity was the thing I loved more than anything else. The idea of making a living out of it, it never occurred to me. I know that sounds really odd. I ended up signing for Celtic as a schoolboy uh, school and then going on to the boys club, still never considered it as a profession. And it came to the stage where, you know, it was, I was either going to be signed on or not, they decided against it. But I'd have said no anyway. Now, that seems slightly odd. I do accept that. That's why there's about 350 pages explaining why <laughs> that's such an odd thing, because I didn't want to lose the love of something that was a real joy in my life. Um, and it took them, the reason why I could kind of prove it is because I ended up eventually playing a little bit with, I was Clyde and I was doing a degree at the same time. But I actually turned Chelsea down for an entire year. That's how much I didn't want to be a professional footballer. And uh, one of the lines I've maybe used slightly too often is I tried really hard not to be a professional footballer and failed badly. But it was, I'm kind of happy I had that failure because it led to a really interesting set of um, adventures through my life and it's, it's been brilliant and it's great to be able to put them in the book. Yeah, that's a very good read I have to say. Um, can I just go back a wee bit there though? You grew up in the east end of Glasgow, one of six kids in a house where money was always tight I think it's mm -hmm. fair to say. A lot of writing about that place at that time focuses on the dark side Drink, drugs, violence, abuse, and chaotic family lives. But that wasn't your experience at all, was it? Yeah, somebody said to me recently, my book's a good companion piece to Shuggy Bane if you ever near cheered up a wee bit. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell many of you here and some people listening or watching online will have read that and it's a brilliant piece of work. Um, but I was very, very fortunate. And it's, you know, certainly I was surprised when I started writing that it actually, I spent a lot longer in that part of my life than... I expected to because you know people want to read about you know the 
the other side, the, the slightly more famous side. Um, but it was lovely to be able to put that across, the, the life of my parents, my siblings, the weirdnesses of it. Um, and the, you can grow up in rough areas. And it kind of doesn't matter if it's the east end of Glasgow or if it's the east end of Edinburgh or if it's the east end of Calcutta. You actually can grow up, because I, I mentioned Calcutta there, and not the right phraseology for the, the, the town, now, the city now, but in actual fact, somebody wrote to me recently, said that felt in my childhood. Because if you've had the love of your family and the support of your family, that is the most incredible thing you can get. So for all the fact that you don't get all these, you know, everything I ever wanted, I had the football books, I had a ball, and I had their love, and that was all you kind of needed, and a little bit of freedom. Um, and also the things that were happening around Easter House and Glasgow at the time, in retrospect, they do seem a bit strange. <laughs> you know, there was one particular um, moment which is recounted in more detail in the book, where we were playing a game at under 12s. I see before we go on, I'm sorry to everyone online, can I see how many people have read the book? Excellent, not too many, excellent. Um, there was, I was playing an under 12 game, I think it is, in Easter House. And halfway through the game, there was a gang fight that came across. And there was people chasing each other with baseball bats and cricket bats. I don't know what they're doing with cricket bats in East End of Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> Swords, which was the go-to thing for the kind of gang leaders at the time. And they ran across, and there was about 50 of them chasing across our game as it was going on. And we stopped. And they ran across, and they fought a bit, and then they, f they went away. And then we just carried on again. Mm. Now, <laughs> Could you imagine that happening now? We'd probably be hearing about it on the news, wouldn't we? And maybe that's another thing that I kind of, looking back and remembering what the 70s and the 80s were like, they were strange, strange days. The, the, fast, the past is a foreign country. Um, and it does seem very, very strange now. Uh, somebody would now be filming it on their camera and posting it on Twitter. Exactly. And it would have made a very interesting film. <laughs> but, so the, it was just being able to see all those things about a very yeah. different and different, what would seem a difficult background. But most people will tell you, go through these things. If you've got the love and concern of your family and friends, it's not that difficult. Yeah. It's refreshing to hear that. And I have to say, I think your mum and dad sound a lot like mine. The absolute determination to do their best for their kids. And understanding that the way to do that is, is through support and love and through education. Um, but your dad did have his odd moments of uh, Glasgow East End <laughs> behaviour. <laughs> I think you wanted to read a wee bit, didn't you? All right, you? OK. I hope you don't mind. I'll, um, Just to give you a flavour. It's, uh, uh, of... it's quite a common thing to read a panel of these things. I, I read the book for the Audible book, and you... Yeah. Uh, yeah if, if you're... If you're do a lot of travelling and you like to listen to audiobooks, I would highly recommend reading this, getting this as an audiobook because Pat reads it himself and it does give it an extra dimension to hear it in your voice. Yeah. Um, the nice thing is even English people seem to understand me. <laughs> I, I That's because you were well brung up. <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I read slowly. Um, a little story about my dad. Um, when I was 10, dad and I walked about half a mile or so to the only grass pitch in the area between Spring Boyd and Barlanock. It's covered by a housing estate now. We were there doing our drills and suddenly three lads in their late teens or early twenties came over and spoke to my dad. Hey, old man, get off the pitch. We're using it now. Don't worry, lads, said my dad. We'll be gone in about 20 minutes. You can have it then. The wannabe bully boys looked at this old man and said, get off now, you old C word. My dad, in his 50s, which I am sure you will agree is not old, was seething. You'll have to make me, was his calm, firm, and to be honest, slightly menacing reply. At this point, you should know that at certain moments, my dad looked not unlike a young Clint Eastwood. He might well have said, go on, punk, make my day. <laughs> you, should know, you should also know that in his time, dad had been a handy boxer in the Navy a Mediterranean champion with an infamous knockout punch. He was only about five foot six, but perfectly built, good looking in that 1940s film star kind of way. And even in the winter, he always looked tanned and toned. Moments later, having launched their attack, the lads dragged their battered bodies away, <laughs> dazed and confused. I looked on, open mouthed, 
in awe of what I'd just seen. But my dad just turned to me, fixed me with those firm, no-nonsense eyes and said, Pat, what are you doing? Why have you stopped dribbling around the cones? <laughs> and it kind of was a wee bit like that. Um, we, uh, thanks for you, We were a family that were honest. There was an integrity about my dad. But living in that background, you also had to take care of yourselves. Um, and that's the kind of dichotomy, or one of the many dichotomies you have. Growing up in a very rough area, uh, we were kind of educated as much as we could be. Um, you, we would never swear in our household. Trust me, that was quite unusual in Easter House. Um, and he gave us everything. However, if you had to protect you or your own, then that's acceptable. Uh, we weren't even any way violent, but there was violence around us. So you had to make sure that you seemed strong as well. So again, to be as honest as that, uh, as my dad and my mum were, and to live that sort of life in the midst of, and by the way, many good people in that area, so many, many great people who had many difficult times, but to still work really hard. In fact, I don't know if it's underlined in the book, I am the family failure. I'm the only one of the six siblings without a degree. I didn't finish my, <laughs> I played football instead. Well, that was very much the, the, the attitude of, of um, parents of, of that generation, working class parents of that generation. I mean, my parents understood that the way to have a better chance in life than they'd had was through education. Mm. And they certainly pushed, I mean, you, you, but you, went off to, you went off to do a degree, but it didn't quite take yeah. into, well, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> in fairness, it wasn't your fault. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, the, the whole family had done that, so that was normality to me. And it goes back to the accidental thing. I thought the odds were much better if you actually just, you know, studied, did a degree, and got a kind of normal job. The idea of taking a chance in football, I mean, it's a massive chance. I mean, the percentages, I knew the percentages, very few made it. And even the ones that made it, you know, how many of them really make it to make a real living out of life? And on top of that, you know, I'm, I'm looking around at the ones that were getting injured quite early and finishing through no fault of their own. To throw all eggs in that one basket was, was kind of scary. So I kind of agreed. My mum, my dad would love to have, you know, me to push myself a bit more with the football and become professional. Uh, but my mum was delighted I didn't. But an opportunity arose where I got to do both at the same time. So I was playing for Clyde, as Val knows well. You can be part-time professional footballers. Indeed. With the mighty Wraith Rovers. Um, and with Clyde at the time as well. So I was able to do both at the same time. Uh, and that was, that was fabulous. It was a fabulous period where to have both of those things. But what that did is not only the background, which East End of Glasgow, family, but also being a student. And a student in the early 80s, as it was then, the whole concept of student life was you debate, you discuss, you ask questions, you learn, you're open to ideas. Um, Again, I'm, I'm not a big fan of cancel culture. The idea is to talk, even if you disagree with someone, and beat them with debate. That was my concept. That's what I was growing up as a student, student to do. But learning all this cultural thing, all the cultural things that were going on at the time as well as a student, when I finally, a year later, accepted Chelsea's bribe to go to play for them, I, can, I was now in a different world. And I was, had a very, very different background to all the other footballers around me who'd come through, through this bubble and they were very, very much you know, tunnel visioned about how they wanted to, to live their life and what they wanted out of their life. And it was very much an outsider. If there was one phrase I would use about the book, you've probably read a lot, of, if you're into football at all, uh, a lot of books by insiders from the inside, which a lot of people want to hear. And it's an interesting take. I'm afraid Mines is not that. Mines is a complete outsider on the inside. So I'm seeing a completely different viewpoint. And classically, I mean, quite early on, I was known as weirdo for most of the players. Thanks, guys. Um, but I often thought that they were the ones that were a bit weird, really, because they didn't have other interests and other hobbies um, and did strange things like not stand up against racism, yes. which I found extremely weird coming from the background I did uh, in Glasgow. So it was an interesting life, and I'll be honest with you, as time went by, I did grow to 
respect them more for the bravery of being able to do that. Yeah. Put everything into that one basket. Because even when you did accept the siren song of, of Chelsea, you hedged your bets even then, didn't you? I mean, you didn't, you didn't just walk away from college. You said, can I take a two-year break? And if it doesn't work out, can I come back? Yeah. I just learned the word sabbatical. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and uh, I went to the, 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 I had a year to do it. And I said, look, can I take a two-year sabbatical? Um, Chelsea offered me this two-year deal. I mean, the chances of me getting a game for them are absolutely non-existent. And they said, yeah, yeah, come back in two years. I mean, it's a bit of a downside. You, all your mates have moved on, so you'd need to do the last year without your friends, that sort of thing. But it was a logical thing to do. Um, and when I was down there, I studied some stuff as well, done some uh, computer programming. That's not very handy these days. <laughs> computer programming from, like, 40 years ago. <laughs> I don't think I'll bother going back to do that module. Um, but that, the, the idea and the expectation was to come back again. Um, and what that gave me, Val, was a real good fortune of not having, oh, well, I did have a safety net. So when I went down to do that job and I watched everyone else, not everyone, but a lot of them playing through fear. And again, it's something I, I strongly believe in, particularly in any job that's creative, but in any job, if you do it through fear, as opposed to the love, you won't be as good, particularly with creative things. Yeah. Um, and I would see all the rest of them fearful of, of not succeeding, losing their place, losing the job, and on the scrap heap. Whereas me, no, I'll just go back and do the degree, it's fine. What a help that would be, and I tried to explain it to as many of the others as I possibly could at the time. You know, actually study some stuff, have, find another interest, a hobby, something else that you can run alongside it. And it's good for you psychologically as well. Yeah. You know, very good. And I think what, what people don't always realise is, is how much time you have, how much free time you have on your hands as a professional footballer. Because there's a limit to how much time you can actually spend in training and uh, not doing too much training before the game because you don't want to wear yourself out. So that gave you a lot of time to engage with the cultural scene in London. And in the book, you talk a lot about your engagement, particularly with the music scene. Mm -hmm. You describe the first time you saw the Cocteau Twins as a night that would live with me for the rest of my life. And over the years, you became friends with Robin Guthrie from the band, with the indie icon John Peel, with Vinnie Riley of the Deruti column. You even took tea with Morrissey. Yes. <laughs> so you'd read books on the team bus instead of playing cards. Can I ask you what might be a difficult question? What was more important, the music and the access to culture or the football, if you'd had to choose? Oh, that's painful. It's actually, that's actually quite a painful question to ask. I loved the actual playing, but I could have lived without it. I don't think I could have lived without music. I really don't. But my love of it and passion for it, and I mean, other forms of the arts as well. Um, but it, anyone who, everybody in this room and everyone listening, you have something that you adore, you love, that is your special thing. And for most people, it isn't their job. You know, it's, you might love your job, and that's great, and that's the perfect situation. But you have other interests as well. I mean, Val, you play in the band. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a passion we all yes, have to. Yes. And it does help you, I think, to be able to you know, take you away from that life a little bit. So I couldn't have imagined, you know, not listening to music, buying music, going to see bands. And I, to this day, I mean, we're sitting in here at the, the art college. See through that wall there, that's the wee red bar. I've DJed in there. That's my <laughs> absolute claim to fame. Well, and I DJ's there, it was about eight or nine years ago. To, I'm completely going off topic here, but... Um, it's not off topic uh, at all. Slightly. So I was about eight, and, I'd, and they'd said to me, could you come, it's a student's union thing, and they said, could you, it was great, could you come back and DJ again? Unfortunately, my daughter has started studying here, and she was doing six, seven years' worth of medical course, and she said, if you come back here <laughs> while I'm here... <laughs> So I couldn't do it again in here. So she's now gone, she's gone through to Glasgow and she's doing her medic stuff, so I can go back into the very weird. And I love that DJ inside of it. Yeah. It's fun, it's not to make money, it's just that joy of sharing the music that you love with other people. And you really embedded yourself in that indie music scene when you were down in London, mm -hmm. um, not because you were Pat Nevin, the football star, but because you were Pat Nevin, the absolute fan. Mm. And I mean, that's, John Peel didn't become your pal because you were a celebrity, it became your pal because you shared that love of the music. 
Yeah, and it was, it was fabulous. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, you should never meet your heroes, the classic line. Um, and it's probably a, it's a good line most of the time. Uh, they will often let you down. Um, except Peely was probably my biggest hero when I was 16, 17, 18, just with the music and all the bands that I'd found through him. Cultural stuff that you found through that, you know that as well. Um, and then when I went down to Chelsea, and Chelsea asked me, things went well at Chelsea, again in the book. There is actually some football in the book. But, um, <laughs> um, um, <laughs> but it went well, and just because of that first year, I was fortunate to get Player of the Year. Uh, the club said, could I write a column for the newspaper? <laughs> How quaint a newspaper. <laughs> a club newspaper. And I said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. But they, they were slightly surprised when I said, yeah, it has to be a music column, obviously. I'm not writing about football. I didn't know anything about that. And they let me in, much to my undying embarrassment, in the back of my mind, I thought, if I do this music column, I might be able to write to John Peel. I might be able to interview John Peel, and I might have met John Peel. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And we met each other and got on so well. And the lovely thing about it is, I had, we had both passions for the same thing, the music and the football. He's a big football fan. Um, ended up coming to the FA Cup final and, uh, when I played for Everton against Liverpool. And of course, he wore all red and I was playing for Everton, <laughs> all blue. Thank you, John. Um, but it was strange because what we had in common was something, we had a passion for our jobs. I had a passion for my football. He had a passion for, his mu for the music. But we didn't, have any interest in the other side of it, the fame side of it, the self-aggrandizing side of it. We just loved it for the art of it. And it's an odd thing to say about football, but it's how I felt about it and still do. And for those who might sigh, and if you're not a football fan, you go, what? Art in football? Have a look at Messi. Not necessarily his bank account, but have a look at Messi or have a look at Iniesta. Yeah. I was once asked if I could be somebody else for a day, who would I choose to be? And I said, Messi. Yeah. Because to have a sense for a day of that extraordinary physical prowess, to be able to do that with a ball, just, just to be completely outside yourself in a different way from losing yourself in your imagination with, with a, a keyboard, I just think that would be fabulous to have that feeling for a day. And you're right about supporting different teams not necessarily coming between you. I mean, my, my bandmate, Chris Brookmeyer, uh, is a big St Mirren fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I made him come to Wraith Rovers uh, when they were playing St Mirren a couple of seasons back. And it was one of those, those afternoons, it was a, what they call a seven-goal thriller, <laughs> which went from one side to the other, from one side to the other. And poor Chris, we were sitting in the, the, the Wraith Rovers uh, stands, having to sit on his hands every time St Mirren scored. <laughs> but I, I say, thankfully, we got the odd goal that day. So I was the one going home with a smile on my face. But it doesn't stop us being friends. And it doesn't, doesn't interfere with the other connections we have through books, through music. You're quite right. It's possible to embrace all of these things together and have those same passions without them being necessarily the same passion. This is one of the things that used to get to me a little bit. You know, in football back in the 80s, it's different. It's very different now. You only really got two reactions if you were a footballer at the top level. It was a, oh, you're a footballer. Or, ah, oh, you're a footballer. You kind of didn't get anything in between. And I didn't, I didn't want that. I wanted the middle ground, the normality. But having said that, you mentioned Chris. I, mean, I know Chris quite well and did for quite a few years. And when you talk to authors or artists, I remember meeting David Mack, the sculptor once. Yeah. And he would say, do we dream of the moment where he was putting a piece together on the tape? And it was a fabulous piece with Dalmatians, if I believe, if I remember correctly. And he said he would do anything to get that immediacy of that roar from his work. Mm. Um, and writers have often said that to me as well. You know, the immediacy of, wow, it'd be fantastic if I wrote that sentence and people went, yes! <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it doesn't often happen for writers. Yeah. The joy is, you, you kind of, when you come to events like this, there's a bit of it. And it's That's, fabulous yeah. being able to react. Now, I have to admit to you, and can I admit here to throw it back onto you, I kind of had a wee bit of jealousy of the writing as well, of, no, no, but you can take it to a different level and people can come and talk to you and say, ah, you made a difference to me there in a yeah. different way. And so there are, there are more things that are in common with just about all areas of the arts, but even work as well, that I think it's definitely worth, A, having a look at, but B, accepting, because all through the years, football's had a bad rap 
and you'll have seen it as much as anyone else, and for some of the time, it's deserved it. But I've tried in some areas of this book to explain that not every football fan's a thug. Mm -hmm. You know, not every game's brainless. There is an art there, there is a beauty there, and it's, it might not happen often, but it's worth waiting for. And it is the beautiful game. I mean, the, the, there's, there's moments when you're watching your team play and, and they just play beautifully. The, the passing is spot on, the finishing's there, and the joy that you feel. Um, my, my partner actually posted a video of me dancing with joy at Starks Park <laughs> a couple of seasons ago because it's just gone so beautifully. Um, and, and it is that, that moment of, of pure pleasure. I think it's, it's great. I think we, I knew and understood where I played that that's a great... I was hugely fortunate to have that, to have those moments. The odd thing is, mine wasn't, was never really the one that you score a goal and it's a really good goal and it's, wow, fantastic. There's not a lot of goals in that book, to be honest, is there? Really? Not really. Not that kind of book. No, that's, but, but it's not that kind of book. No, but, it's but, not. It, but, you, but when you do write about on the pitch stuff going, going well. I mean, it, you convey that sense of, of the excitement. And I think, you know, you're talking about c coming to an audience like this at a book festival for writers. It, I mean, I, I really missed that in lockdown. Mm. I didn't realize how much I got back from the audiences until I didn't have the audiences to get it back from. That first time you do a Zoom event and you, you get no reaction. And it's you tell a wee story that you think might provoke a laugh and there's just silence and tumbleweed. And you think, what do I do now? So it's great to be back among you, I have to say. It's fantastic just to hear those, those wee mutterings and those wee sighs and gasps. It's fabulous. We really missed you. Yes. <laughs> I went by. Well done, yes. Yeah. Go and give me a shout out. Sorry, let you go. I was, just, I was actually, yesterday, I've had a very strange week. Um, but yesterday I was at Manchester United uh, playing against Leeds. You know, but 70,000, whatever, in the stadium. You know, the first thing that looked and felt like normality for this huge amount of time. And what I, th I, d I hadn't realised how much I'd taken it for granted for all those years to have that passion, to have that feeling, to have that, that community. It's an extraordinary thing. And it was, the game was 5-1, it was a great game. There was some great artistry in that one as well. Um, so it was an amazing thing to get back. But it, I don't know if it was any more amazing than two other. That's the one thing, the fans, having them back, the supporters, people together congregating. But there was one thing that was, I was even more concerned about during the lockdown, because I went to all the games. I missed the supporters. I missed people. It was dreadful. It wasn't the same. But then there was the squealing of the footballers. <laughs> you could, oh my goodness. I couldn't believe it. All these big, strong guys going, ah! Every time, it was, honestly, it pierced around the stadiums. It was, uh, it was um, that's the one thing I'm very happy to get rid of in all this period of time. <laughs> so you've talked briefly there about, about that sense of being an outsider on the inside. Mm -hmm. It's not ever easy being the outsider in, in, in a, a particularly where there's any kind of collective. I mean, I, I cast my mind back to my early days in newspapers when I was often the only woman in the newsroom. Uh, and however hard you try to be on the level with everybody else, there's always that sense of having to try harder to be accepted. Did you, did you feel that? No. Okay, good for you. <laughs> no, well the done. Being, no, the reason being, I, I, I say for a reason, I'm really happy, happy you asked me that question. Because it's kind of, I don't know if there's many reasons, and I don't want to be standing in a soapbox, um, but if there was one reason for writing the book, one big reason was to to explain to outsiders, it's all right, it's fine. You can be different. You can be yourself within any space. If I could survive as a wee fey indie guy, <laughs> you know, dressed a bit odd, and was you know, post-punk, and with these footballers who had this totally, almost diametrically opposite point of view in life, and I could survive in there and still be myself, that's kind of almost the story yeah. of the whole thing. Yeah. Is to say, if, if I can do it, and you read this book, and you feel in any way emboldened and empowered to actually have, believe that you can do it yourself, then that book's been worth it. Yeah. That, more than anything else, that book's been worth it for that. I actually, then, as, a, as the years went by, and I, I guess you've kind of enjoyed it too, you almost embrace 
be outside of status mm -hmm. and yeah. enjoy it. I think I've done not bad for a gobby wee lesbian for five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, I love that. That, that is the perfect answer. The perfect I, I, Can I say, well, I love that. <laughs> oh, wow. That is exactly the answer. You can be yourself. And if you have the passion and the love of whatever you're doing, you will be accepted for it. And you sh the one thing you generally don't get accepted for within groups, I found, if you try too hard to fit, if you try too hard to be like them when you're not like them, it's, it doesn't work. People see through it in the end. And it's not, it's not always a good thing. So, yeah, that's the whole... I'll, I'll be a gobby wee guy for Easter House who... I wasn't that gobby, but comfortable in my own skin to be able to say the things you want to say. But you have been gobby over the years because whether it's from your upbringing or your involvement in the cultural world beyond that, you've developed a pretty strong system of, of ethical beliefs and, and views. And you've taken strong stances mm. publicly about different aspects of the game. You write about homophobia in the game, in the book. Do you think you see this more clearly because you avoided the laddishness of the dressing room? Um, I think, it, again, it goes to the background of growing up as a student, being interested in then becoming friends of people who are musicians, artists, etc. Um, we didn't have any homophobic feelings in our family anyway. It probably just wasn't thought about it much. Discussed back now, I'll be absolutely honest with you. But certainly by the time you know, I'd gone down to London in 1890, I just thought, who cares? Just human beings. And I was absolutely stunned by the... There was homophobic... Um, racist, everything was casual back in the 70s and particularly the 80s. Um, and without, again, standing in soapboxes all the time, I was really keen to just speak about it and be open about it. I'll be honest, um, Val, I don't think one of the press wanted to talk to us about it. Because any time I brought it up, they all <laughs> moved on. You know, the racism stuff, even that, at the yeah. time, in the early 80s, people didn't want to talk about it. They just said, oh, that's cool. that's the culture we live in just now. But of course, me from a different background is thinking, I'm not accepting that, particularly if there's 10,000 people having a dig at a black guy or whatever. I mean, I quite often, I don't know if you'd enjoy the, the idea, I'd be, there's certain places you play like Millwall or West Ham, and I'd be running down the wing. Now, because, because I'd been in an art gallery and once read a book, obviously I was gay, right? <laughs> With all the fans, right? And of course, I got this all the time. I'm not using the language, but you, you can imagine the language. I would get all these people shouting at me. Absolutely no effect. I just smile and go. <laughs> <laughs> like, why worry about that? And if I would turn around, if I ever get a chance to speak to them, I'd go, I come to not be gay, but so if I was, who cares? And, I, and I'd, I've, happily, we've come a long way. And maybe that's the point. Of, there is a chapter which deals quite strongly with my thoughts and what is homophobia within football. Um, and I oddly think now it'll be okay. I think the next player that comes out, or the R player that finally comes out now, it'll be cool. Um, the backing you'll get within the game will be extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I have no doubt about that at all. And that's been the case for a long time. From the stands and the terraces, that's that's culture, that's your nation's culture. You need to work on that. I'm not saying that's easy, that will not be easy. Because it was hard for any black player to come in, any, any different player. But because you have the extreme backing, and the generation that's grown up now, they kind of don't care, do they? Yeah. They don't. And it's moved on. And it's one of those things where I wrote about it, and I was keen to talk to you about it because um, I've chatted to a few people and they said, are you sure about this? Are you sure about this? It's, it might be really hard. Yes, it might be hard. But it's for someone who's an outsider within that and still has grounding within football, I think we'll be surprised. I think we'll be okay. Um, and and I hope we are, obviously. Statistically, there must be gay players in the Premier League. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and it's quite clear that they don't play in a particularly gay way. <laughs> because somebody might have noticed. <laughs> so I think, I think some people used to think I did, <laughs> played in that sort of way. Um, but to be honest, it's, I mean, I know, again, it's mentioned in the book, I, I got to know one player who I found out 25 years post my career that he was gay. And I didn't know. And I just, 
And because I have, first of all, you know, I wasn't looking out for it. It was just it was a teammate, you know. And I was with three of my friends who had played at the same time. And the reaction was really interesting. You know, the, the first one was, oh, we didn't know that. That must have been difficult for him. And the second one went, yeah, that was really tough. It's a bit strange. I wish he could have spoken up and talked to us, you know, and it would have been fine after a bit of ribbing. And the third one went, yeah, he did, he did dress better than us, yeah. <laughs> 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 that was it. That was it. And then move on. And, it, and I, I think and hope we're there now. And that's why, and there's hope, again, there's stories in, in that chapter which are quite, hopefully, quite funny as well. Mm. Uh, within that, uh, not to be too poor-faced about it. Poking fun sometimes is the best way yeah. to get past people. I think the, the, the thing that, that you also talk about quite a lot in the, in the book is racism, which you've been you know, anti-racist campaigner from your earliest days in, in, in the game and, and beyond. Um, and I think we all felt that huge strides had been made. And you know, Marcus Rashford's extraordinary mm -hmm. work in, in trying to make sure kids got fed uh, I thought I'd, I'd really changed people's perspective. And then the Euros came along, and Marcus and his colleagues went from hero to zero in a matter of a few minutes. And the response, the racist response to that was, was horrifying. Mm -hmm. So do you, it's, it's, it's dispiriting, because like you, I thought we had come a long way. And then to see that turn on its head with so much negativity was really painful. It was really dispiriting. It's horrible, but... Perspective's a good thing. Mm. You know, this mostly happened on Twitter. It mostly happened online. Um, the percentage of the people that were behind, the three players that missed the penalties, absolutely dwarfed the, I don't like to use the word morons, but I'm tempted, yes. um, that were racially abusing the players. And it's, I kind of, a wee bit like that myself. You know, I've, I've got my own little coterie of trolls that follow me around. You know, I've got them, you know, and we've all kind of got them. And see, if you spend your time thinking that's the way the world thinks, you'll be poisoned by it too. It's kind of not the way society is. It's a, there's still a percentage of societies like that. But it isn't 10,000 people standing, singing and bawling and making monkey noises together. Yeah. It's not that anymore. It is smaller numbers. We don't take it easy. We don't take a foot off the gas. None of that. So has it gone away? No, it hasn't. Has it gone away in society? Of course it's not. Has it improved? Yes. It absolutely has. I would be a liar. It may not feel it when you're the one getting the abuse, because we've all been there. Mm -hmm. It feels as if the world's against you. And then you, if you can stand back a wee bit and think outside it and think, actually, the vast majority... There was a moment, the game the other night, Sacco comes on for, against Brentford for Arsenal. Standing applause from the entire ground. That's where we are. That's where we really are. And we have to remember that's where we really are. And we keep on educating. We keep on getting the, the, the story across. It's, there's a story myself about, it's a very similar with Paul Canneville. When I was, you know, the, the abuse that he was getting, and I made my points very, very clear in the press. The next game, I walked out with Paul and our big centre forward, Kerry Dixon. And the Chelsea fans sang Paul's name first. Not mine, not Kerry's, Paul's. And I remember thinking, that's what you can do. You can make a difference. But it's a lot of education. Sadly, that was 40 years ago. <laughs> and we'd, uh, 30 years ago. And we've, we're still fighting that fight. But we need to keep on doing it. And yeah. we will. It's about forward movement. I mean, you know, when I left Scotland in 79, it was because I couldn't have the kind of life I wanted here. And when I came back in 2014, Scotland was voted the best country in Europe in which to be gay. So mm -hmm. there is progress. Things change, things move forward. You do, and you, but you can't stand up. You feel as if you're, you know, you're almost saying there's not a problem. People miss... We live in a world where it's... Reactions and actions are binary. Absolutely binary. Which, and world life isn't binary. Yeah. You know, and the action is... Oh, if you're saying it's improved, you say there's not a problem. No, nuance didn't say that. And that's where the difficulty we've got just now is in a world where nuance is being ignored, particularly online. Um, but I will not stop doing it. I will keep on saying it. There are improvements in many areas. The racism was one of them. But we do not stop with the campaigns. And you were the chairman of the Professional Footballers Association. You're working hard behind the scenes to take care of players who'd retired, players who were injured, as well as the ones still in the game. 
you seem to have a sense of the importance of service. Mm. Is that something you think came from your family? Yeah, very much so. It's a kind of, there's a background. There's like, we kind of strange country we live in here, you know, there's like, Protestant work ethic and the Catholic guilt and they all get mixed up with other <laughs> sometimes and the Catholic background that I'd been brought up with was you you really shouldn't be so self-indulgent about anything and we spent our lives having no real interest in the my, my daughter digs me up I used to wind me up about this no great interest in things I don't want to own anything I don't really go to shops and want to buy that. I just don't have any passion for it. So I haven't got that kind of feeling. Um, and it kind of re moves over to what the family are. It's, it's kind of what you should be doing for other people as well. Yeah, enjoy life and have fun and do your things that you like doing. Please remember it's not all about you. I mean, you could go into real depth in this, but my mum's great line was, nobody's looking at you, you know. And it was a bit like, <laughs> Yeah, you're probably right now that I think that. She was telling me that since I was 10, if you were ever <laughs> concerned about what people thought of you. And I could, we could be in front of a big audience in a football ground. It stuck with me all my years. It's a third person you are to people who are watching. So see if someone laughs at you, I don't get embarrassed and I don't get nervous. See if I do something wrong. I promise you, you all might laugh at me. I'm laughing at me more. I find me more risible than anybody else. So if you have that attitude towards it and you can spend as much of your time maybe trying helping other people, and there is, if you look around and you get older, you realise giving's better than getting, isn't it? We're going to open up, up to questions in a minute, but before we open to questions both here and remotely, I just want to ask you a couple of quick answers. What was your worst moment in the game? Uh, I think getting smashed in the face by Gus McPherson when I went to head a ball. No, I did, honestly. I went to head a ball in training at Commander, and I went up with that. And as I was doing it, I thought, I've not checked behind me. And you always check behind you. It's like mirrors, you always look. And I didn't. And I thought, oh, there's nobody there. And he smashed in my face. And I was lying on the ground. I got up and I said, oh, I'll be okay in a minute. I'll be okay in a minute. And the entire team saying, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? Face gone, smashed in. So uh, I could look at a deeper moment and I could talk about all other things, but the sickening pain uh, of that was horrendous. Okay, and on the converse of that, what's your best moment in the game? Best moment in the game, it's, to be honest, it's the most meaningful moment um, and it will stick with me and it always will. Playing for Chelsea, second season there, not on the pitch. Had played well, walking off afterwards and walked home, because I used to walk home. <laughs> Can you imagine that now? Um, at Chelsea. And as I walked home, this old man walked in pace with me. And he said, I, you're Nevin, aren't you? Um, wanted to say hello, and I thought you did well today. I don't get out very much. Um, I came out today and you entertained me. Um, so thank you. And I went, oh, really? And I went to talk to him and he just walked away. <laughs> and I went, and the, old, the rest of the way home, I thought and thought and thought and thought, that's why I play football. That's it. In a nutshell, that's it. Entertain, give something back. There might be hundreds, there might be thousands, there might be only a few old men, old women, young men, young women who have had that moment because of you. How can you do anything better than give joy to other people? So, best moment of football? Walking up the Fulham Road meeting that old guy. This does feel like volume one. Is there more to come? Volume two is actually finished. <laughs> Fantastic. So, we're now going to take some questions from home and abroad, as it were. So, would anyone like to put their hand up and start the ball rolling? We can have I a jump, roving mic. Can I jump in for just one second? Oh, sorry, yes, of course. I've got a prize here for anyone who were asked a specific question, and the prize is for you. And if you don't, you don't get it. Get out. Okay. Somebody up the back there. Um, Pat, I loved you as a football player, but I wondered, what's it like when you are up against a vociferous home crowd? Is it, does it motivate you? Anfield as an Everton player, uh -huh. Arsenal, Tottenham as a Chelsea player. Do, what, what does it build? Do you, do you recognise it? 
how does it feel? Yeah. I'm an aspiring football player. I've not made it yet, but <laughs> it's it is one of those things. I tried not to live off it um, because it can be very addictive. And uh, that buzz, the home and away is totally different. Actually, both of them stirred me the same way. Uh, when you get a ball, especially if you're a creative player and someone gives you it, and you feel this weird buzz and noise of, ah, oh, he might do something. And the kind of expectation and the support and the push. And I, don't, I hope I have no arrogance in my body. Um, and in anything, I'm not super confident in many other areas of life. And even off the pitch, you see as soon as you walk over the line and you get that noise behind you, it's extraordinary. I don't care who it is. You just don't care. I could be playing against the best defender or player in the world. I think I'm better. It's the weirdest, weirdest thing. But you put me in any other situation, it's not the case. You need to use it. And see when the, if you can feel that other side of it, which is when you're playing for Everton at Liverpool, and they're giving you dogs abuse, and they're shouting and bawling at you. If you can have the mindset of, <laughs> you're worried. It's a really great lift. You're worried, and you can almost turn around, not arrogantly and go, right, good, that's what I want you. I couldn't do that in any other part of my life. But you put you on a football field and you can do it. It's an extraordinary thing. It's one of the things to learn, I suppose, in sport, is being good enough at something, being dedicated, training hard enough. They're all the things you need. See that bit in there? That's the hardest bit. And if you get that sorted, uh, in your own way, because there's different ways for different people. Uh, and the great managers knew that, and that's how they get the best out of people. God, that was a long answer for a quick question. <laughs> so we've got a question here from Sandy Snedden saying, in the book, which I really enjoyed, you say that you were dropped or refused by some teams because they thought you were too small. Is this still the case, or has the success of the likes of Messi, Iniesta, Modric, etc., changed this perception? You know, the oddest thing is, you know, football has and, and always does change, life does change, business changes, etc. Um, but certainly in the past, in Scotland particularly, we had skillful small players. Um, but there was a period where power plays were the big thing, particularly in England. Mm -hmm. uh, very particularly in England, a thing called Pomo, position of maximum opportunity, where they just lump the ball in the box, in the mixer, etc. The rest of the world kind of wasn't doing it. They were still looking for their wee number 10s and the, you know, the Maradonas and then the Messies, etc. Because of the change in the laws of the game, the rules of the game, it's easier to get booked, etc. Um, it's probably a bit easier now to be small and to be technically good. Um, and I also think I've put it a lot down to certain individuals, but the joy of Barcelona, the joy and the beauty of that team, and again, go back to the art of it and the creativity of it. I mean, I'm smiling when I talk about them. You know, I, there was a period of time when watching them, you know, it was almost like, it was almost religious. The, the beauty that they brought to that church, that, it was amazing. Um, Messi, Iniesta, who happened to be my favorite. Um, Jaffe, they were all little guys, but they were geniuses. Um, and they changed it all. And you still see it to this day with Manchester City, try to do the same sort of thing. Um, so it wouldn't happen now. Um, and I've got a favorite player called David Silva, who just recently left Manchester City. And he played football exactly the way I was trying to. Exactly what I was trying to do was what he did. He was annoyingly better than me, but, <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with that to see the beauty in someone else's genius. See, maybe you were just born too soon. You know, born I, I, 20 years later, you could have been in that Barca side. <laughs> well, do you know what? The modern game would have suited, yeah. and usually me better than others um, of that period. And it would be nice. Can I tell you a wee story completely different? Of it? I always think of different ideas. They talk about the game and how it's changed. And one of the things about the game is this flat pitches now. We used to play potato fields. They try to do that. And I watched a game between Spurs and Manchester City a few years back, and it was at Wembley. But it was the day after an NFL game. And they had to play in the pitches we used to have to play on. They couldn't do it. So that made me feel as if maybe I'm not as far behind them as I thought I was. Has anybody else in the room got a question? Yes, over here in the white T-shirt. If you could just keep your hand up till they get to you. Thank you. 
Um, I read that you shared a flat with Adrian Thrills, is that right? <laughs> yes. So my question is, um, who was your favourite journalist, NME journalist from that period, about 78 to 84, yeah. and why? And as an addendum, what on earth has gone wrong with Morrissey? <laughs> <laughs> no, we've only got a few minutes. <laughs> I think I stopped hanging about with Morrissey. That was the problem. You know, I, I, actually, there's a lovely story in the book about uh, <laughs> Stephen and I meeting up, which was hilarious. Um, oddly enough, the journals at the time, I'm going to surprise you maybe slightly. I mean, Cosgrove was writing at the time. There was a variety of other people whose writings are kind of light. But I kind of learned something else about him. And I, like, I learned the negative side. Um, Adrian Thrills is my flatmate. Or, or he was known at Chelsea, Adrian, don't we all? Because Adrian Thrills, don't we all? Uh -huh. You know, that's a terrible joke, footballers. Um, but in actual fact, what happened was I'd, I'd written a few things for the NME myself under different names. And that's the other thing, I've always, I've always written. And the amount of people that say to me, who wrote the book for you? And I'm like, yeah. mm. <laughs> yes, I did write it myself, so if it's rubbish, it's my fault, right? Um, but I actually went into the NME offices once, and it changed my viewpoint. Uh, in fact, I went in a few times, but there was once, and there was this discussion going on about how they were going to hammer this new band, who I didn't particularly like either. But it was, seemed so snide. And it seemed, wait a minute, they're the artists. You're just a critic. And I remember it, it was like falling from my eyes, and I thought, you really good writers, you fabulous writers. You're not, writing, you're not using it in the right way because there was so much negativity. And over smart to be, it's much, much harder to write positively or even constructively. Being snide, which it was, and I made the mistake once myself. I wrote a review in the record mirror and I was snide about one band. And I tried to get it back before it went, on. It went uh, to print. I couldn't get it back. And from that day on, I've never, ever, I don't think, ever been snide about anyone who is trying to be creative, whether I like it or whether I don't. So there was good writers there, and some great photographers there as well. Uh, but in the end, the, the thing I learned was to get rid of that from those people. Strange answer, I know. And in the same vein, uh, Gary S. was asked, what book have you most enjoyed reading in the past year, excluding your own? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know, the difficulty is I've been writing so much. Um, and I love that this, this one was finished before lockdown. Mm. Um, it's a weird kind of story how it happened. Somebody annoyed me. It was in the prologue. And because they'd annoyed me and tell me that I had to say what people wanted to hear for um, clicks, I was fuming. I just sat down and started writing. And then after about 120,000 words, I thought, I better kind of st stop now. Um, so I showed it to uh, the publishers, and they kind of liked it. But I didn't stop. I kept on going. I kept on writing. And I've actually, the second one's finished, and the third one's well on the way. So I don't know if it'll ever come out, but it was a joy. And I loved the process of writing. I don't know how much you love it. Mm. I love the actual process of the writing. Uh, so th that was totally and utterly brilliant, that side of it. What was the question? <laughs> What's your favourite book this last year? So that's my big excuse for the fact that I haven't been able to read that much. Um, and what I have done is I've agreed to do a television show um, in a wee while, and you have to have a specialist subject. So I've been reading one of my very favourite authors all over again, because that's the idea. If it's your specialist subject, and you're going to spend hours doing something, you may as well just go and read one of your favourite authors. So. Uh, I should know Woodhouse back to front quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot worse things to be exactly. delving into. I think we've got time for one last question from the room. Thank you. Uh, which question would have won the prize? <laughs> ah, <laughs> so disappointed. <laughs> it has to wait to another day. Um, I'll tell you, there's, I'll tell you two questions, right? And one question I usually get from this audience, which I can't give away because you're seeing it online, and I can never use it again. And the other one is when I'm doing to kids. And the kids, there's always a question, there's always a prize. And uh, the question they always ask is, how much did you earn? <laughs> <laughs> and they always, always ask it. And I'm always happy to tell them that, you know, in my entire career as a Chelsea player, and getting player of the year twice, 
I managed to earn what an average Chelsea player would earn in roughly two weeks now. So things have moved on a wee bit. I'm no. not bitter about that, by the way. Yeah. I, I'm not, honestly. Yeah. But that's the question that the youngsters always ask. It's, it's one of those questions, though, I mean, that you, you, you left the game just as the big money was coming into the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Do you think the money's had a positive or a negative effect overall on the game? And, and we'll have to be brief here. Lots of, lots of negatives, um, huge negatives, but fabulously, the fans grabbed it back. When the European Super, Super League started being pushed, I, I never thought it was a goer anyway. Uh, when that happened and the fans stood up and said, we're not having that. It was one of the most joyous things that's happened in football for many, many decades. And there are joyous things that happen in the game. But see when the people who really own the game take it back from the people who think they owe the game. Well, I tell you what, from last year, that was the biggest thing to celebrate. And that's a great note to finish on. Thanks very much, Pat. You've been fabulous today. But before we go... Pat's book is on sale in the bookshop here, which is in the old fire station, out just outside the entrance there. Get out there, get the book bought, take it home, buy it for your friends, buy it for your loved ones, buy it for people you don't even like very much, because <laughs> it's a really good read. Um, and also for you at home, use indie bookshops, use your local bookstore, get a hold of this book. Honestly, you'll enjoy it. And if you can't do it any other way, listen to it because it's a great book to have in your ears. So can we have a big hand, please, for Pat Nevin? Thank you.